The arts page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Honoring Helen Daniels Bader's passion for the arts and creativity, the fund brings community arts to underserved audiences and is a proud supporter of local arts programming on Milwaukee PBS. Welcome to this special episode of The Arts Page. I'm your host, Sandy Max. We're revisiting and updating a powerful story of a creative talent lost forever that is titled Stitching History from the Holocaust. In 1939, Milwaukee was a beacon of hope for Paul and Hedvig Sternad. The Sternads lived in Prague, Czechoslovakia. They knew they were in a dangerous place and were eager to leave Europe. Tragically, they died in the Holocaust. Their personal story would have never been known if it wasn't for the discovery of a misplaced letter with a handful of dress designs in a basement in a house in Bayview. The Jewish Museum Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Repertory Theater's costume department collaborated to transform the preservation of these archived documents into something engaging and special in a way that has brought Hedvig Sternad's creative and artistic talents to life and is touching others around the country. This story starts with one handwritten letter. December 11th, 1939. Dear Elvin, I received your last letter and thank you very much for your kind care. I was very glad to hear that you are troubling to get an affidavit of necessity for my wife as a dress designer. Would you be so kind as to let me know if you have any success in this matter? You may imagine that we have a great interest of leaving Europe as soon as possible because there is no possibility of getting a position in this country. By separate mail, I have sent you some dress designs my wife made. I hope the dress manufacturer you mentioned in your letter will like them. Hoping to hear very soon from you, I remain with kind regards to you and your wife and with the best wishes for the new year. Yours sincerely, Paul. The Holocaust happened to real people and that the loss of talent becomes apparent when something is recreated or created from something that is lost. Stitching History from the Holocaust is really a look at two different things. It's a very individual look at a specific couple and a specific family, but on a much larger scale, it addresses the huge void of talent, the, the loss of contributions to the world that were never able to be brought to fruition because of everyone that perished in the Holocaust and all the hopes and dreams that perished along with them. This exhibit takes eight dress designs that were sent to Milwaukee in 1939 from a couple in Prague, Hedwig Strunad and her husband Paul, to a Milwaukee cousin in the hopes of getting uh, immigration visas. We knew we had something very extraordinary because the sketches were beautiful and the letter was poignant. The letters have been in the collection of the museum since before it was a museum. They were given to the Milwaukee Jewish Archives in 1997 by Burton Strenad, who was cleaning out his mother's basement and found them. He had no idea that his father had had this correspondence. His father is Alvin, who is the recipient of these letters. And within the envelope was a red envelope, and within the red envelope were eight dress designs, a picture of the woman and her husband, and a letter to Bert Strenad's father. And in that letter, they were seeking help in coming to America to escape the Nazis in Prague. Paul Sternad in Prague knew that uh, Alvin was trying to help him come to America with his wife, and he enclosed these sketches in the hopes that that would convince uh, people in the United States that they would not be a burden on the economy. Burton Strenad turned them over to the archives, never knowing, you know, would they be on display? He just knew that they would be preserved. The sketches were an indication of talent that was lost. And when the museum was installed in 2008, it became a focal point of our Holocaust section. Well, one of our visitors came in, and when she came to this section, she said, um, oh my God, and the story is so poignant. And she said, there's so much you could do with the dresses. I said, like what? 
She saw her make them. And that was the first time we kind of had this sense of the, the story, that you could have this kind of tangible focus on loss and filling that void in some way to help us, you know, kind of fill in the blanks of who Hedvig and Paul were and what this, the larger meaning of this story is. From the first letter, we did not even know Paul's wife's name. It started as this very slow process of trying to figure out who this woman was, because in the letter itself, it just says, my wife is a very talented dressmaker. So we went to the Yad Vashem names database and we researched Paul Stranod. And in researching Paul Stranod from Prague, we found a list of people. And then we triangulated out from there that one Paul Stranod is married to a woman listed in the Yad Vashem names database as Hedvika Stranod, and her occupation was listed as Lady Taylor. And there is a niece who is listed at the bottom as the person who submitted this page of testimony. So we then kind of constitute our research efforts on finding the family through the names database, but also in looking for that niece who was living in the early 1990s when she submitted this page of testimony. Paul's nieces, Lisa Lott and Brigitta Neumann, his sister's two children, they went on the last kinder transport that left Prague and they are alive and we could not find them. And we tried for two years to find them. And quite by chance, uh, we have a young student at Lawrence University who was doing a, um, uh, an internship at the Berlin Jewish Museum. And we sort of tossed off the idea that maybe he could look yet one more time. Could he look one more time for Brigitta? And in the space of a couple of days, he found her. And we sent him to interview her and we made contact. We learned more about Hedwig as well. We found out that, we found out her name. We thought her name was Hedvika, which it was in Czech, but that was how she was identified on all of the concentration camp uh, records. But the family spoke German. Um, so she was known as Hedwig or Hedy. And that changed again how we thought about her. The other things we learned is that she had red hair which, you know, when you have black and white photos, being able to have that one kind of visual detail gives you a sense of this is who this woman was, that she was a redhead, and that she owned her own studio. Brigitte's nine-year-old memory, you know, that she was nine when she left Czechoslovakia on kinder transport, was able to recall going to her aunt's studio and having her people who worked there create doll clothes from puppets for her. And that, you know, gave us this whole new sense of who these people were and what they did. She was a favorite aunt, and Paul was a favorite uncle of Brigitta. So uh, we, we got the sense that she was a really nice person and, uh, and that they were fine people and well-liked. The exhibit was kind of built out of this 1939 letter, which we knew from the envelope that it arrived in and was stamped with Nazi signage or Nazi uh, symbolism that it was a letter that was censored. And so the language, it's not as urgent as you would expect a family putting out a plea for help to have been. We found another letter that came one year before the initial letter that we have. The first letter we have is from December 1939, which is after World War II started. The other letter is October 1938. And what makes the difference is that without the censorship, Paul Sternod, the one in Prague, is reacting emotionally and openly without censorship to the sense of betrayal he feels when Mun the Munich Pact has been signed and he feels that the Allies have betrayed his country and given away pieces of Czechoslovakia, the area called the Sudetenland. Even now, strong anti-Semitic tendencies are making themselves felt such tendencies as never even existed before in this country. These tendencies will probably not be able to be kept in bounds, and one may even presume that they will spread all over Europe. Nothing will remain, therefore, to do but to adapt oneself to the circumstances and to consider emigrating from Europe. He is fearful that all of Czechoslovakia will be taken over by the Nazis, which turned out to be true that anti-Semitism will overwhelm Europe, which turned out to be true, and that he and his family must leave Europe or their lives will be in danger, which also turned out to be unfortunately true. I am writing, therefore, 
to ask you whether there is a possibility of immigrating to the USA, where I and my wife might find some occupation. My wife is 39 and for the last 17 years has been running as proprietress, a first-class dressmaking establishment. She has a number of work people and enjoys a very good reputation in Prague as she is very diligent, has a first-class knowledge of her line and has very good taste. Our director, Kathy Bernstein, approached the Milwaukee Repertory Theater and uh, spoke with the costume department. Our shop manager from last season was contacted by the museum about this project. And after she saw the drawings, uh, she was so excited about the project that she said, we're in. There are coats, there are suits, there's dresses, there's a formal dress. I don't think they were all part of one collection, although we are showing them as one collection. When you see the colors, it's really surprising to know that here's, here's a person that was in Czechoslovakia during the Holocaust, and we have these really brightly colored dresses. So we received copies of the renderings, and then um, as project manager on this, I did a bunch of research into the period, period fashions, uh, using period catalogs, magazines. We gather all of our research, and then it's time to create patterns. We take fabric, uh, cheap muslin, and we actually drape it on the form to create the patterns. We then cut out the pattern out of an inexpensive fabric. We make a mock-up of the fabric so that we can correct all, every, all the problems in the pattern without having to cut into the real fabric. The draper hands off the patterns to us once they're ready, and we cut out the fabric, and then we hand off the fabric pieces, the garment pieces, to the stitchers to assemble them. The tailoring techniques we're using are old standard techniques that they would have used back in the 30s that actually we still use to, today. There was quite a bit of hand stitching, especially in with the tailoring, the pad stitching, and the bound buttonholes are all done by hand. All the dresses are made of natural fibers and fabrics that we would have found in the time period, in the 30s. The only synthetic that I can think that we are using is the thread to, that holds them together. But Jessica has tried very, very hard to be as faithful to the period as we can. We use things like fibers like wool, silk, rayon, um, and also weaves that, that would have been popular in the time period. We have uh, a rayon gabardine, we have wool flannel, wool boucle, and, and uh, plain woven rayon. Three of the looks have printed, printed fabrics in them, and we obviously couldn't source those exact prints, so we, we had to find somebody to create them. Margaret Hassett Guy has recreated the prints that Hedvig drew in her drawings. What's really unique about these is you can see the direct correlation between the surrealist movement in art and the prints. And Margaret went beyond Hedvig's designs and she went, she did research on her own and researched textiles of the period and art of the period and really brought an authenticity to it. We built these dresses to an average size, today's size six, which back then would have been a size 16, which is the, well, the average size of a woman back then. What's really unique about her designs are the colors, the details, and the prints. They're not something that you would find in a, in a store at that time. In addition to the garments, the eight garments, there were also accessories that were depicted in, in the fashion rendering. So we have hats, we, um, and there were some purses, we found gloves, and we also shopped shoes. We felt we would get beautiful renderings. What we hadn't understood was that this Milwaukee Repertory Theater costume shop went above and beyond what we thought 
There is no place that was better outfitted than the Milwaukee Reps Costume Shop to do this. There are people who understand historical research with clothing. There are people who understand how to develop a design and to take it through a whole schematic and go through these things. And they were able to bring this level of professionalism that I don't think any of us entirely accounted for. They also pointed out the challenges very quickly about making the dresses. We thought this was such an easy part of the exhibit that our research part was going to be so much more challenging. They were given these two-dimensional paintings or drawings that you couldn't see what the back was. You certainly, there was no indication of what the fabrics were. There was no indication of, you know, if a dark spot was a shadow or is it a fold, is it a pleat? So everything that you see on display here is a work of interpretation by the Milwaukee Repertory Theater's costume department. After we got this interview with Brigitte, she sent us in, a couple months later, a letter. And it, it's very eerie when you get a letter and it has the exact same handwriting as a letter that is from someone who has been deceased for a very long time. And it's the exact same handwriting, it was in German, and it was from Paul Stranod to his brother-in-law, Ernst. There's a short note at the bottom that says, love to your children, signed Hetty. We took that signature and we had it cleaned up. The rep actually designed a label looking at what other historic fashion house labels of that time. And so it says Hetty Original, which is kind of the sense that these are Hetty Originals. Each one of the garments is finished with that label. And it does make it feel a little bit like she's put her stamp of approval on these garments. To really demonstrate that this was you know, these were her designs and her dreams. Um, that was kind of the perfect finishing detail. We are in awe of the, the care that they took and they fell in love with the story. It wasn't enough to just copy. They wanted to be faithful to Hetty's designs. They imbued it with such love and devotion. Um, the work ethic is impeccable and it really exceeded all of our expectations in terms of bringing this collection to life. And now we have this series of ensembles that are part of a larger story. We know that Alvin submitted immigration documents for them and we know that they weren't able to escape. We found out first of all that uh, Paul and Hedwig along with all of Paul's family, um, were all transported to the concentration camp called Theresienstadt. Uh, and we found out, as we did more and more research, that uh, most Czech Jews went to Theresienstadt, and that the story of the Holocaust in Czechoslovakia is a little bit different than um, the history of the Jews of the rest of Europe. Paul and Hetty are deported to Theresienstadt in 1942. Theresienstadt was the major transit camp for all Czech Jews. There were a number of artists and leaders, and in fact, German intellectuals were often sent to Theresienstadt as kind of a first point before they were sent further east, because this is a way of saying, no, we've just resettled them here. So there, there was this cultural life that existed at Theresienstadt. We know that both Paul and Hedwig were transported from Theresienstadt to Warsaw, and that's where we lose them. We don't know the exact circumstances surrounding their death, but we do know that they perished in the Holocaust. We found out that everyone in Paul's family uh, perished in the Holocaust, so that it, it serves as an example of the story of Czech Jews. It made me realize how many people we have lost to this Holocaust, uh, the artists, the writers, all the creative types that we will never see their work. And looking at these dresses, that's what this is about. What could Hed Hedwig Sternad have done beyond that? What could anybody who had talent, what are we missing in our world today without all of that creativity? When you highlight the life of one person, and you research that life, and the, that person becomes a real person. These dresses she never had the chance to make, but clearly she made many other dresses. And now we see what they look like. She's not just a number. She's just not, but she's someone who could have been and should have been, and she's, she's real. She's 
more than just a dressmaker, she was an artist. I really respect her as an artist. She had a vision that was out of the ordinary, and I really would want to tell her that I really respect her work as an artist. To all of these decades later, to be able to kind of go back and create something that we know Hedwig and hopefully Paul would have been very proud of is such an honor and a privilege for us. I think she'd be excited and pleased that someone so many years later, you know, took the time to realize these designs. I think that the reason that it will be moving is because her dream is realized, because we were able to do something so unique. We've now taken Hetty's design and have made them three-dimensional. It's quite amazing the amount of detail that they were able to execute in doing this, and they are very much, um, have a couture feeling. I would like to know that she'd be proud of us. You know, I'd want to know that we did it right. If Hetty were alive, I hope she would like the craftsmanship of the dresses, but I also hope that she would appreciate the way that we're telling her story, that we didn't want this to be a fashion show. We wanted this to be a really loving tribute to who this person was. And so this is, this is an exhibit that shows you the power of preservation. None of this would have been possible without that initial donation to this, to this museum. And we were able to pull Hetty's story, Hetty and Paul's story, so beyond the eight drawings with the letter, which is so poignant. As I speak about the story to people who are unrelated to Milwaukee, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, young and old, they are captivated by the story. All of us who have been involved with the project would hope that she would be really pleased and that she would be honored that we all thought enough about her and the value of her life and her dreams to try and, and bring some of it to life. So I, I hope that um, she would have been proud and that she would have uh, given her blessing to us. I think that the legacy of the Stranads, Paul and Hetty, is one of a couple that was truly in love with each other, but also a couple that was a real partnership. It's kind of interesting that in 1939, rather than representing his own talents as a banker, or his own work, this is a man who's saying, my wife is a very talented dressmaker. This is going to be the thing that we travel on. Her work is the work that is going to enable us to survive. Wherever you have genocide, you have lost talent. That the world is less because they, their lives were snuffed out and their talents were never realized. So this is a way of exploring one person out of six million and who that person was, what talents they brought to this world, what they could have done. But hopefully people walk away and they will have been enriched by it and hopefully it gives them pause to think about their family, their history, and what they can do to pay honor to that moving forward. The stitching history from the Holocaust exhibit continues to tell the impactful story of the Sternads. Since opening in 2014, the exhibit has traveled around the United States, making stops in Manhattan, Miami, and Madison so far, showing Hetty's inspiring dress designs while communicating the historical importance of the Sternads' tragic experience. The exhibit travels to Farmington Hills, Michigan's Holocaust Memorial Center June through December of this year. Then, due to popular demand, the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee will remount the exhibit in April of 2018, so you'll have a chance to see Hetty's designs in person. It will be a fitting homecoming for the story of the Sternads. Curious visitors so far have even included fashion icon Diane von Furstenberg. And more importantly, this award-winning exhibit has created opportunities for engagement and discussion around issues of immigration, injustice, intolerance, and legacy. For much more information about the exhibit, including photos and a video of the opening lecture, visit the website stitchinghistory.org. Learn more about the arts page and catch up on our previous episodes when you visit the Milwaukee PBS website at milwaukeepbs.org and click on the arts page. And please like us on Facebook at the arts page to get updates on artists you've seen on the show and share your feedback and ideas. 
I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for watching this special episode, and please join us next time on The Arts Page. Funding for The Arts Page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Committed to bringing the creative arts to underserved audiences, the Helen Daniels Bader Fund encourages collaboration and innovation that strengthens our community to make our world a better place to live. I'm Sandy Max, host of The Arts Page. Each week we bring you stories of art and artists from around the world and around Wisconsin. Meet Milwaukee food photographer Grace Natoli Sheldon. She creates mouth-watering images for food magazines and her own kitchen art. Kitchen art is a thing I started years ago, probably 35 years ago. It's art for kitchens. It's still lifes of food. It can be anything. What I do is I just start setting things down. And then I take a shot, see what I think, move it around, change the light. The light, it's all about the light to me. It's how the light hits the subject. I move the light around a lot. People just say, you know, oh, I could just eat that, or I just want to lift it off the page. And it's, it's how I feel. So it's nice that I'm getting other people to feel exactly how I'm feeling with my art. Watch the Arts Page Thursdays at 6.30 on Channel 36.1 and at 10 on Channel 10.1.